and come back full video. And thank you guys for joining tonight on uh, Zoom and Facebook Live. Uh, this is April the 20th, and we are in our second week of talking about uh, Greece and some of the destinations that I visit in Greece. So thank you people, you guys for joining in, all you people. I know there's some on Facebook and Zoom, and I wanna apologize straight away that I didn't get out an email or a um, or too many uh, reminders. So thank you guys for remembering to join in. Uh, it's been kind of a crazy busy day with uh, all kind of things going on in my life that uh, pulled me one way or the other, but all's great. I'm glad to be here and talking about travel. It's the one thing each week that roots me to what I really am passionate about. And that's getting out and exploring and uh, going to other destinations. And um, now, gosh, just today, if you've seen any of the news has been online or whatnot, uh, Greece has been threatening to open up and they really have opened up the tourism from uh, from for people coming in from the, e the European Union and from, uh, I think, 19 other countries, which one of us is uh, one of them is the United States. And so we're allowed to travel there as of today and to arrive as long as we show proof of vaccination or proof of a, a 72 hour proof of a, a negative COVID test. And um, so uh, we're working toward uh, maybe doing some trips in June on that. So without any further ado, let me uh, move on and let's look at the first destination here uh, of what we're gonna talk about today. Last week I talked about a new tour, I'm calling it the Taste of Greece. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, the tour that I've done year in and year out for the past, oh, I think since 2013 or so. And I call that the best of Greece, which uh, starts out up uh, in the north on the mainland of Greece at a place called Delphi. So let me uh, let me get to that real quick. And here you can see our, our map of this tour route. And over here is Athens up in the, the, the right-hand uh, corner. And we basically fly into Athens on this trip and we leave the airport straight away and go up to this far distant site called Delphi. So let me uh, show you a little bit that, about that and I'll talk to you about it as well. Hey, David McGuffin here in Greece, in Delphi, the ancient site of... It's this is the Temple place. of Apollo, dating back almost 2,000 years. I first met my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. She willed her wheelbarrow on the streets wide and narrow, singing cockles and mussels alive, alive, alive. Hey, from Delphi, your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. So this side of Delphi is um, where a an oracle or a soothsayer, fortune teller, would uh, reside. And the rich and famous leaders from Greece would come to this sacred site of Delphi and to seek advice from this soothsayer or oracle. The oracle would be in this temple that I just showed you, the Temple of Zeus in the back, sequestered down in a little cave area, sitting on a, like a tripod looking thing, uh, a conical shaped so stone. And they say that there was, uh, nowadays we, we know that there was 
some sort of vapors coming out of the earth that would cause this woman who is a soothsayer or the oracle to have these um, visions and uh, euphoric uh, prophecies that would come out of her mouth. And believe it or not, they believe so much in the gods and everything else that uh, the rulers and the kings and the leaders took that to heart and acted on it. So this is a very important religious site as far as uh, Greek uh, history goes. But in addition to that, it's also a site where folks would come together to experience uh, theater, which you saw me singing uh, Molly Malone in that theater. And also uh, you would see that um, just in a few minutes, there's gonna be actually a place, a big, a big arena there where foot races and, and uh, games, uh, Olympic type games would go on as well, just like the destination we're gonna go, go to the next in Olympia. So let me scroll through this and I'll talk a little bit about these photos. You have to use your imagination quite a bit because all there are, are foundations, but these steps going up to this temple, let me back up here. Let me run it again. These steps going up to this temple were lined with little kiosks, just like we would go into an arena or a stadium here at home. And in each one you could purchase, uh, you know, souvenirs or uh, merchandise for the God you were going to uh, lay out a sacrifice for. for. And uh, you could buy, uh, you know, uh, chicken wings and that kind of stuff and maybe some Bud Light or whatnot as you made your progression to this temple for your pilgrimage up there. And uh, so these were the steps or the, that go up to that temple of Zeus. You can see it's in a desolate valley. It takes some doing to get here. This is that stone I was telling you about um, that the uh, oracle would be perched upon and soaking up these vapors coming out of the ground. This is the altar where sacrifices were made. This is the temple here. And this is amazing wall. It's put together, uh, no mortar at all, but all those stones fit together. But called the Cyclopedian Wall. And in the Temple of Zeus here. And for me, it's a great way to start the first day of this tour because there is no stress. You, we go check in the hotel late in the afternoon when there's hardly anyone there visiting it. We uh, go out and see the sights, uh, sp spend some time at this uh, sacred place, and then spend the night in the town of Delphi, which is a small village of about uh, 600 people and six hotels. There's the arena or the, um, yeah, the arena there, the theater, typical Greek theater with the temple down below. From high in the hills in the mountains of Delphi, this is David McGuffin saying your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. Here's the, uh, the area where they do the foot races and everything. And you can see this would accommodate about 30,000 people right through here for all kind of races and uh, competitions and games and everything. Things we think of like would be in the modern day Olympics. So moving on from Delphi, we go to the Peloponnesian Peninsula. So we cross we cross this little entrance into the Ionian Sea, which is on the far left. And then uh, we cross, there's one bridge right here, we cross that. And this whole area down here is called the Peloponnesian Peninsula. 
And we're going down to uh, a town or a region called Olympia, which is famous for the first ancient Olympic games. And boy, you really have to use your imagination here. I don't have a whole lot of photos and no video of this, but um, uh, there's a lot of temples here. There are to worship, but there are also places in where the gladiators, well, I don't think they were called gladiators at that time, where the competitors would train. So there's a school for wrestling. Uh, there's a school for uh, foot racing and uh, discus throwing, uh, javelin throwing and all of that. And there was actually little buildings built to house and to accommodate all of those young men who were participating in the games. And uh, they would train for a couple of years and then participate in the games. And this is uh, at, at that region, Olympia. Um, we, Olympia, the town of Olympia is very small as well, uh, but it has quite a few nice, nice resort type hotels. This is one that we stay at on our second night of this particular tour called the Best of Greece. And uh, it's just, um, it's a nice place, got a really fantastic swimming pool. Uh, the restaurant's right here where we're looking at where we would have dinner together. And so in the sunsets, beautiful looking to the west there. So from there, here's what I'm cooking for dinner tonight. Begin with two eggplants and kind of peel them halfway. Slice them lengthwise. Add salt and salt on top of them and let it sit for 30 minutes to bring out the water. Then slice them lengthwise again, making strips. And here are the ingredients that you'll need for the remainder of the process. I'll review those at each step as we go. The main ingredient next is the uh, ground beef, onions, and garlic coming up next. So you have your eggplant, fry them in batches in olive oil until they're golden brown. Put them aside on a paper towel to drain. Don't be in a hurry, let them get golden brown. After the eggplant's out of the pan, add a little more olive oil and butter. Let the butter melt down. And then add uh, one onion and two cloves of garlic. All chopped, finely chopped. Saute that until it becomes translucent. Can you smell it? <laughs> Next, add about a pound and a half of a lean ground beef and brown that, incorporate it in with the onions and garlic. That's 80-20 ground round. Then we're gonna add some spices, my Chianti spices, a little bit of nutmeg, and a little bit of cinnamon. The Chianti spices are my own mix, but you can use uh, basil and parsley and oregano mixed together, about two tablespoons total of that. I need to be careful on the cinnamon. Be careful on the cinnamon, don't put Oh yeah, I said much. that. Don't put too much in there. Add salt and pepper to taste. A 
let that cook down then you're going to add some tomato sauce to that about eight ounces of that incorporate that into it blend it in very well let the tomatoes start bubbling a little bit and then you add a half a cup of red wine any old red wine is fine Stir that a bit, let everything simmer for around 20 minutes or so. Still simmering, then put off the heat and let it cool for 30 minutes or so. After it's cooled, add one beaten egg and stir that in and incorporate it in. It'll begin cooking really uh, because it'll still be warm. The uh, meat will still be warm. And set that aside once that's finished. So now you have the eggplant being layered one layer on a 9 by 13 sheet then next layer layer number two is put on the meat mixture so you're going to do a total of two layers of everything so eggplant first then the meat mixture and then uh, some parmesan cheese Sprinkle that on there. And then you do the whole process over again by putting the eggplant on top of that Parmesan cheese, a final layer of meat, and a final layer of um, cheese. Then you make a bechamel by whisking some flour into the melted butter. Let it form a paste. You'll be warming some milk while you're doing this. And then after it's a paste, pour in the warm milk. So from the roux, which is the butter and the flour that made a paste, now you're making a bechamel with the milk incorporated in that. Just keep stirring until it's rich, creamy, and velvety. Put in a little nutmeg and salt and pepper to taste. Then pour that over the entire dish of your soon-to-be moussaka. And for the final topping, add another layer of Parmesan cheese. And put it in the oven, bake it 350 for one hour, and you're ready to go. Enjoy. I don't know if you can uh, hear my gas oven popping on and off back here behind me, but uh, I've got it in there and it's uh, been going, well, almost an hour now. So uh, for 51 minutes or so. And so we'll take a look at it after we're finished up here and see what it looks like. In addition, we're still having a little uh, kind of typical Greek antipasti dish today. Uh, I have the um, pita bread, along with the tzatziki sauce, which we talked about last night, some kalamata olives, uh, and some, um, some cured meat. And so that's what we're having for our, our, our pre-dinner treat while I'm talking with you guys. I hope you guys are also uh, munching on something and drinking something as well. Um, I was telling Leslie earlier that I haven't uh, found any Greek wine locally, so I can't, uh, I can't help you with that. But I'm gonna go on the hunt for it. Uh, so maybe next week I can show you a bottle of it or not. But uh, 
Greek wines, um, you know, is very prevalent. There, 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 there's orchards all over the place. Uh, and so grapes are growing everywhere. And so they harvest it. And it's basically just uh, local drinkable wine that comes, uh, it's, you know, it's white and red. And um, so it's, it's very readily available all over the place, but nothing so spectacular like other places in France or California or Italy or whatnot. Um, they're also famous for a type of um, a fortified wine called Retsina, which is, um, I've never even tried it because it just sounds terrible to me, but it basically, they say it's uh, like syrup mixed with pine bark and or pine sap. And uh, so I've never tried that. And then they also is talking about drinking. Uh, their famous um, aperitivo drink uh, is called a Uzo, which is a licorice type of uh, a drink, kind of like Prenard or uh, even, um, well, I think that's Prenard is one of those uh, from France. So uh, I'm not a fan of any of those things. So, uh, but I just thought I'd share that with you as well. So uh, let's move on. We're going to, uh, from Olympia, we're heading south. We're going to this peninsula called the Mani Peninsula, which is way down, uh, way down in the, in the southwest part of the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And there's uh, two di three different peninsulas there. So we're in the one in the middle. And, uh, but in route, we're going to go uh, really, really off the beaten path. And I don't know of any tour other than mine that go to this next temple called the Temple of Apollo Epicureus. And uh, that means Epicureus is the helper, a helper, Apollo's helper. And this temple was, um, let me just show it a little bit and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. This temple uh, was built uh, in 400 to 450 um, BC and uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Hi, David McGuffin here, way up in the mountains on the Peloponnesia Peninsula in Greece at the Temple of Apollo Epicureus. It's shrouded here in these, uh, this tent that's been here for probably about 30 years, but work's going on in one of the most well-preserved temples in all of the ancient world. The Temple of Apollo Epicureus here in the area of the mountains known as Bassi, the little veil in the mountains. That's Charlotte and Janie. Notice there's no one around. So underneath this tent is this temple that's being restored. Similar in size to the Parthenon in Rome. Actually, it's built by the same guy who built the Parthenon in Rome. And the Greek government is going to big pains to restore it because they can, and it's out in the middle of nowhere and not inundated by tourists all the time. You can see that the temples are symmetrical uh, even when we talked about temples in Sicily, the same Greek type of temples are here. So if it has uh, 12 columns long, it would be six columns wide. And uh, the it's just amazing. Apollo Epicurious. Here at Bassi, in the heart of Greece, this is David McGuffin saying your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin. I'm going to pause it there for just a second to give you a little history of this thing because, like I said, it was built in uh, from 450 to 400 B.C., and used as a place of worship and a pilgrimage, they didn't call it a pilgrimage at the time, but a site where locals and people from far away would come and worship. And Basi is a little uh, hamlet, a little um, uh, gap in the mountains, basically, is what we would call it nowadays. And um, so it would take days and days and days and days for people to get there to worship. And um, so it at with the fall of Greece, not even the Romans discovered it. It was so far afield. But it wasn't until like the 17, let me look at my dates here, 1765 that it was rediscovered in 
basically pristine condition, but just imagine it had been sitting there for uh, almost 2,000 years at that point. So crumbling, earthquakes, and all that stuff. But otherwise, it was in pretty good condition. And the gentleman who was a, he was a surveyor from France, and he was uh, building, building some villas on the coastline nearby, and he saw it from afar, and he made note of it, and then he uh, wrote it in his little notebook, and he wanted to come back. He came back, couldn't find it, and then all of a sudden, they, the, the locals found him murdered because uh, no one wanted the, this temple discovered by the outside world and just the locals. Well, fast forward to um, the 1860s or so when um, the, the country of Greece, or what we know as Greece, was dominated by the, uh, by the, um, um, the Turks, and they were ruled by that. And uh, there was a British gentleman who was excavating all over Greece and basically uh, just asked the local curator, Turkish curator, could we go uh, make some digs in this area here of this temple? And they, they took a lot of the frieze, the, uh, the area around the top of the temple. They, they took it, said, may we have this? Yeah, you go ahead, take it. We don't want all this stuff. And so it went to auction and the British Museum bought it. And so the frieze from this temple is now in the British Museum, which is kind of crazy because when you go to London, I can walk into this one room and uh, the room is the exact same size as this temple. You look up and you see the frieze that is supposed to be in this temple that's sitting right there that they're restoring and making plaster cast of all of that. So it's, it's crazy the way all of that works, but uh, I guess that's how it used to, to work back in the day. Same thing with the Parthenon in Athens, you know, the uh, Lord uh, Elgin, who, um, Lord Elgin, who was a Brit, uh, got permission from the Ottoman Turks to take away the, uh, some of the, the frieze and the marbles from the temple there on the Acropolis in, in Greece. And uh, it's now in the British Museum as well. And if you happen to go to Athens and we go to the Acropolis Museum, the new, newly founded Acropolis Museum that's about five or six years old, um, you'll see that there's uh, blank places that say these pieces were pretty much stolen by the English because they're by the Brits, because they're supposed to be right here in Athens where they originated. So that's happened all over the place. That's why you know, the Vatican has so many vast treasures. That's why the Kings of France and the Louvre Museum have so many treasures. That's why the British Museum has so many treasures. But uh, this place, the Temple of uh, uh, Apollo Epicurus, is pretty fantastic because it takes some doing to get there. And it's just great to uh, be able to uh, be there with no tourist around and see the reconstruction of it and see what the temple really looked like. So... Let me move on. That's a lot of talking for that one, one topic, but I'm, I'm passionate about that. Sheep and goats are all over the place here. Hey, David McGuffin here. Today I'm in Greece on the Ionian Sea. I'm in a village called Cardamili. I see it here in the background behind me. And it's a nice little place just to take a vacation while you're traveling around. There's nothing to do here, a few shops to see, but the, the water side is wonderful. And we've just had a great day here uh, doing really nothing other than relaxing on our trip through Greece. The mountains are beautiful. The highest peaks are over 7,000 feet back there. I'm told that there's snow on the mountains from uh, November through March. Looking at the village of Cardamili. Wow, what a beautiful sunset. The waves are crashing here on these volcanic rocks. Your adventure starts right here from Cardamili with David McGuffins exploring Europe. Wow, <laughs> I got soaked. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
just a little montage of Cardamelia as well. There's a little port, a couple of islands, beautiful places to swim, pristine, clear water. Way up on the mountaintops, you can look down on the whole peninsula here. If you like to do some hiking, exploring. This is a, not a beach, but a, a boardwalk that you can just dive off in. The main square here in the little town And of course, there's a church on every corner. So from Cardamili, we leave the Mani Peninsula and we go down to this, uh, this, this um, rock jutting out into the sea called Momanvasia. And um, it's just kind of a phenomenal. There's, it seems like in, in many different countries, there's uh, mountains jutting out of the sea that um, are surrounded by tidal basins and whatnot. Uh, probably the most famous that I know of is in France called Mont Saint-Michel. Uh, but this is a moment Vazia as well. Um, and it al also was a fortified area where it was um, well defended. Walls were put up. Many civilizations lived here since the sixth century. So let me just look a little bit at that as well. Hey, David McGuffin here. I'm in Greece at an ancient town known as Momenvasia. It's kind of like the Mont Saint-Michel of Greece. So I'm on a rock about 300 yards out from the mainland, which is back here behind me. Uh, and uh, so this rock outcropping has been fortified for centuries and centuries and centuries. I'm right here in the main square. There's a former mosque from the Turks, which is right here behind me. There's a pretty modern bell tower, which is only 300 years old or so. <laughs> a um, Byzantine era church with the red dome behind me. And we're going to take a hike up to the cliff side where the, where the original town was, where it was fortified. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoy this look around this ancient town of Momenvasia. So hiking up to the top of town from the main square, the steps began to climb climb and climb past many different uh, old ruin homes and churches. Hey, in this video, I'll keep panning back to this domed church in the main square known as Christos Elkomenos, which means Christ in pain. It's reported that there were over three dozen churches here in this little settlement, or as it's known in all the pamphlets, this hamlet. This is a former Byzantine single aisle church. And in this direction, you can see two other churches just within sight of where we are. When I mention churches during the Byzantine era, that's in the Middle Ages, about 1260 to 1460. Climbing still to the upper town, which really started, started beginning to be inhabited around the 6th century AD. So these steps are leading up to the fortified version of the old town. This is another example of one of the many churches here in town, an old Byzantium two-aisle church. It was converted during the Venetian time in the 17th century, as you can see, kind of with the uh, lintel arches, uh, the lintels and the arches kind of give an indication of being part of the Venetian Empire. It's not a tough climb from the <laughs> lower town to the upper town. Just take your time and enjoy the views. Here is yet another entrance through a defensive uh, wall and gateway, one of many on the mountaintop. Once walking through that defensive gateway and coming to this plateau, you have broad sweeping vistas of the uh, Greek mainland and the new town below.
the new tower There's is the about the church in the main square that I pointed you know, out in the old. beginning of a Christos Elcominos. Crowning the top of the rock is the Byzantine church, the Church of Agia Sophia. Walking in, you can see some wonderful frescoes, original frescoes, and without a soul in sight. Such a great way to get up close and personal with these frescoes. It's really tough not to reach out and touch them, which I know no one is supposed to do. <laughs> in the 16th century, the Venetians uh, took over this church and modified it a bit, so you'll see a lot of Venetian architectural style, especially like if you've been to Venice and gone into St. Mark's Cathedral, you see a lot of the icons there as well. Back outside, we're literally on the top of the mount now, the old town, littered with remains of old churches, ancient civilizations stretching all the way back to the 6th century AD. There's quite a bit of cisterns up here to collect the rainwater. Uh, to the top of the rock here in Momentasia. This is a uh, modern restored church, Byzantine era church, called the Hagia Sophia. Walking around on the top of the rock, you really have to use your imagination to uh, think about where these people lived and the fortifications that were put up century after century after century. Uh, here yet another little domed church, could be a mosque from former times. And finally, we're looking down from the top of the rock down to the new town, down through the main gate and little walkway. Hey, thanks for looking around this town with me. Your adventure starts right here with David McGuffins, Exploring Europe. So let me stop this share and just come back to you full screen for a minute and uh, and talk to you a little bit about the you know what what I like about Greece uh, as we've gone through this process starting in uh, the first of December the first week of December I think I've shared with you a little bit about my first experience of traveling to Europe and outside of the USA back in 1977. And the first place I arrived was uh, there in um, there there in Athens, Greece, on this three-week tour that I was on, and it was just so fantastic that uh, you know I I couldn't sleep even though I was jet lagged because we had flown from Jacksonville to JFK in New York, and then from New York to Rome, spent uh, the lunch air time. We went even left the airport and went and had lunch somewhere else in Rome and then flew and arrived in Greece about nine o'clock that night in Athens. And the next morning, uh, I was still so excited. I woke up even before daylight. I heard a guy uh, sweeping and shuffling below my balcony of my room. I got up and my friend and I, Doug, uh, we struck out exploring the city of Athens and uh, I've been doing that ever since. And so it was just such a great experience from that time in May 70, 1977. Um, so when I was able to finally um, retire from teaching band in 2013, I designed a, a tour of the Best of Greece tour, which I've kind of shown you a little bit the last two weeks about and covered the destinations. And then uh, just in the last uh, two or three weeks or two weeks here, I've added another tour to my repertoire of Greece tours called The Taste of Greece. And uh, that's to give you an experience in about eight or nine days of uh, Greece without having to uh, go hike around Malmendasia or truck up the mountain at Delphi, but to have a pretty much flat land good uh, experience of uh, seeing Athens for three days. And I've sh I shared with this, this with you last week as well, seeing and experience Athens three for three days 
going over to Anathlio, which is on a seaside uh, little village there, and then spending uh, th three, that's two nights there in Anathlio, and three nights uh, we fly down to the uh, very popular island of Santorini and spend three nights there. And uh, so I've kind of worked that out, but uh, I want to see if I can get to my, this next screen, my website. That, I wonder where it might be here, possibly. Uh, yes. Here we go. So I think, can you see that, davidmcguffin.com, I think? So if you click over here on this little tours and drop down to Greece tours, I must be sharing this as uh, a bit slow. There we go. This is the tour I was, this is the experience and tour I was talking about tonight, the extra areas. And this is what I've just designed and put up here uh, this week called A Taste of Greece. And um, I'm gonna click on that and just show you a little bit about it. It's what I covered last week along with a tad bit of what we did tonight. But I'm, I'm uh, like I say, Greece has made a commitment to open up. This is the village of Santorini, by the way. Let me just let that scroll possibly. And this is also in Santorini on the Caldera. It's my friends of La Rosa in Santorini. This is the Parthenon in Greece. Uh, this is Nafleo looking out from the fort. And this is in Gre uh, Athens as well. And the Acropolis in Athens. And back to Santorini. So basically, you can scroll down there and look at the look at everything, the itinerary, which I kind of talked to you about last week. Uh, so we would visit, uh, start in Athens for three nights. We'd visit the Acropolis, very laid back. We'd have a group dinner together all three nights in Athens. And um, that's I've just kind of put that there and have group dinners together because, boy, I enjoy uh, eating and, uh, and uh, experiencing the local life in Athens. And uh, I think you know, if you climb up on the steps and uh, a little bit and go to an outdoor cafe, which they're all going to be open at this time, it's going to be a fantastic experience if, to have this uh, Greek cuisine. So we'll do that for three nights in Athens. We'll take a, a, a tour in the Saronic Gulf on a, on a boat, and we'll do that uh, on the third day while we're in Athens. And that particular thing visits three islands called uh, Hydra, H-Y-D-R-A, Hydra, um, Aegina and Porus, and that's just a great way to get out and relax on a, on a cruise, a short little cruise, but also experience three different uh, remote islands in the Saronic Gulf, uh, just south southwest uh, of Athens. And uh, then we leave, when we go to Nafleo, and I, maybe I'll just, there's a map somewhere here. I don't know. It's for me. It's blocked by all the people on uh, on the on the on the list here. But uh, there's a map there that just kind of shows you. And then we spent two days in Nafleo, two nights in Nafleo, a seaside port. You can do some swimming, basket on the beach if you want to. Sit at a cafe as a pedestrian friendly town. We'll visit the ancient city of Mycenae, and then we'll uh, go to the Athens airport and fly to Santorini. And we'll spend three days in Santorini, which uh, you've kind of seen a little bit of that um, last week. And I'm going to share that with you next week as well. I'm sharing three islands with you next week, uh, Santorini. Uh, and I'll also share with you um, the island of Skopelos, where the film Mamma Mia was made, the most recent film Mamma Mia was made. And I think I'm sharing with you the island of Idra too, which we'll visit on this trip. So there's three days there in Santorini, just a great place. We'll stay in a, uh, an area right on the caldera uh, in the town of Fira and be able to just experience great things there. And so if you want to take a look at that, I'm arranging that for uh, a student tour early in June uh, that we're trying to make up some lost time for tours we didn't get to take last year. But uh, later, later in June, 
I think I'm uh, going to try to muster up a group of uh, 10 or 12 people and do that. And I think I've designated the date to be the 23rd of June to the 1st of July. So if you're interested, uh, you don't even need to click sign up. Just uh, text me or email me and say you're interested. And uh, I've already got my friend Nikos there in Greece uh, working on this for us. So I feel pretty certain we're going to have a, a, a quorum of people to do that tour too, because gosh, I'm itching to travel. And I know a lot of people are, I've talked to a lot of people on the phone today, even who said, uh, where can we go? We want to go, we want to go to Italy. We want to go to Ireland. And uh, so I've just been saying, well, listen, Greece opened up. So let's do that. But if you're thinking about other places in Europe, I think by the time um, August, September, October rolls around, I think everybody's going to be so fed up with all these restrictions and stuff that everything's going to be back open. I think we're going to see a floodgate open up here in just the next six weeks because Croatia is open. A lot of the Balkan countries are open. Greece is open, which is actually part of the EU, and they're kind of bucking the rules. So we'll see that open up. The UK is uh, sick and tired of it, and their restaurants have opened up. They're going to start opening travelers, opening travelers, I think, the 12th of June. So we'll see how things go. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, optimistic, but yet the entire year I've been shot down every time I've been opt optimistic. But this has got some great possibilities. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, so if you're interested, uh, give me a call or a text or email, let me know. And uh, or if you just want to chat about travel, I've had some people call me today and just say, hey, how you doing? We want to do this. When can we do this? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so uh, that's great, too. But uh, anyway, it's just so great for me to get back and to start thinking about uh, traveling and um, being able to think about even getting on an airplane, which I hadn't done since uh, December of 2019. Well, I did go in when do we go? March, March of uh, 2020, about five days before everything shut down. So we went to DC on that, but that's about it. So anyway, I uh, hope you've enjoyed a little bit of Greece and this part of it that I've shared kind of off the beaten track destinations next week. As I, sh as I mentioned, we're talking about some islands in Greece. And from there, I don't know where we're going. Uh, why don't you tell me, maybe we can find some places you know, and let me know where, you, where you'd like to look at. All right. Thank you, guys. I see uh, uh, even Johnny, Nancy, David, uh, Tom, uh, at least on, um, on Zoom and some others. So thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you guys next week. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.